Thanks for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Kim Dami in Seoul. The 2024 Summer Olympics of return to Paris after a century came to an end on Sunday with a star-studded closing ceremony and also a preview of the 2028 Los Angeles Olympics. Team Korea is returning home with 13 gold, 9 silver and 10 bronze medals, its best to finish since the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Tensions are escalating between Russia and Ukraine, with Moscow now warning it will deliver a tough response to Ukraine's surprise incursion into Russian territory. Ukraine is accusing Russia of using North Korea missiles to attack Kyiv. More and more foreigners are coming to South Korea to study or for training with a great interest in learning the Korean language and more about the country thanks to the growing popularity of K-pop and Korean culture. In fact, a record 200,000 foreigners came to the country to study in the first half of 2024. Paris wrapped up the Summer Olympics, a first return to the city in 100 years on Sunday, with a sneak peek of the next one in L.A. in 2028. Team Korea managed to place themselves eighth on the medal table. Our Kim jong shil has more. The 17-day international sports event has come to a close. For the first time at the Olympics, a winner of women's marathon got her medal at the closing ceremony. Sifan Hassan from the Netherlands received her gold. Often referred to as the highlight of the Olympics, until now, men's marathon winners would traditionally receive their medals at the closing ceremony. This time at the Paris Olympics, though, the last day ceremony was saved sorely for women. South Korea continued collecting medals until the final day. Song Seung Min claimed bronze in the women's modern pentathlon on Sunday, becoming the first Asian woman to win an Olympic medal in the sport. 21-year-old Park hye won silver in the women's over 81-kilogram weightlifting, the first Olympic weightlifting medal in eight years for South Korea. Those added to South Korea's medal tally as the country finished eighth with 13 gold, 9 silver, and 10 bronze medals. This is a joint highest number of golds won by South Korea, tying with its record from Beijing 2008 and London 2012. The U.S. won the most medals with 126. The highlight of the closing ceremony came with the Hollywood-style handover. Tom Cruise appeared like a scene from a Mission Impossible movie standing on the roof of the Stade de France. He leaped down into the stadium before speeding off on a motorcycle with the Olympic flag. The closing ceremony then transitioned into a video of the actor skydiving down to the Hollywood sign, which was decorated with the five Olympic rings, giving a sneak peek of the LA Olympics in 2028. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. And President Yoon seok praised all the athletes and coaches who took part in the Paris Olympics, saying the 17-day sporting event will be unforgettable for all Koreans. In a Facebook message on Sunday, Yoon said even though South Korea had sent the smallest team since the 1984 Olympics, Team Korea achieved an outstanding result, scooping up 13 gold medals, 9 silver medals, and 10 bronze medals. The leader remarked that not only the medalists, but every single laugh they gave their all and surpassed their limits, inspiring and moving the nation. He said the nation will continue to back the future of Korean sports and told the athletes to continue challenging themselves. And a number of uh, Korean athletes really made the most of the summer games, not just in terms of their performance, but also for their charms and unique qualities. An Song Jin tells us more. The 2024 Paris Olympics has been eye-grabbing, not only for its fierce competition and performances, but also for its behind-the-scenes moments that show another side to the athletes. South Korean table tennis player Shin Yubin is one of them. The 20-year-old won fans at home and abroad when the scene of her eating bananas, rice balls, and peaches went viral. She also had pictures of her with an ice pouch on her head bringing even more attention. Her cute image gave her the nickname Biagi, which mimics the sound of a chick chirping in Korean. As Olympic stars grab attention, related products have also gained popularity. Peaches similar to the one eaten by Shin saw sales surge within days and the number of searches for them also went up.
Similarly, a pop-up store in Seoul saw strong sales of photo cards with various national team players on them, which had a one-gram gold medal added. Most of the photo cards were already sold out early on. Commemorative coins for the Paris Olympics sold in convenience stores in South Korea were all sold out as well, reaching sales of up to 50 million won, or 36,000 U.S. dollars. As viewers found interest in Olympic stars, some enjoyed a bump in their popularity. National fencer Oh sang -wook has been gaining fame for his charms. The 27-year-old was the first Korean fencer to win two gold medals in a single Olympics game. Since his appearance at the Olympics, his social media followers nearly doubled. South Korean silver-winning pistol shooter Kim Ye-ji also became a notable star as one of the coolest athletes. She went viral on social media with her style, futuristic eyeglasses, and cold chic look. Even Elon Musk, the head of Tesla Motors and social media platform X, commented on the platform that Kim should be cast in an action movie. The Olympic Games is about more than just the matches. It becomes an opportunity to get closer to the athletes that shine for the country. An Song Jin, Arirang News. President Yoon suk returned to his state duties on Sunday after his week-long vacation, during which he met with market merchants and South Korea's armed forces. Now, his first task was to name incumbent Vice Justice Minister Shin Mujang as a candidate for a prosecutor general. On Tuesday, the president is likely to veto the opposition party's unilateral passing of contentious bills on broadcasting, unionized workers, and a universal cash handout of around 100 and $80 per person. He will also grant a special Liberation Day pardons, likely to include former Gyeongsangnam-do province governor Kim kyung soo According to sources in the ruling party, Yoon and First Lady Kim Gwani are planning to meet former President Lee Myung-bak and his wife for dinner, with Yoon likely to seek advice on his experience of clinching Korea's first nuclear power plant expert deal with the United Arab Emirates. Also this week, President Yoon suk is uh, planning to introduce a new vision for the unification of South and North Korea. 30 years after Seoul set out a three-stage formula on how to achieve the task, our Oh Seung explains. President Yoon suk yeol will initiate a new discourse on Korean unification as he delivers a speech this week to mark Korea's liberation from Japanese colonization on Thursday. An official from the office of the president told Arirang News that the South Korean leader will share his thoughts on unification with the public during his speech on Liberation Day, building on the national community unification formula introduced by former President Kim jong sam in his own Liberation Day speech 30 years ago. The formula envisions a three-stage unification, beginning with reconciliation and cooperation, a union between the South and North before they completely unite as a country. The two Koreas are still in a state of ceasefire after the 1950-53 war, with tensions escalated by the North's nuclear and missile threat. Yoon is expected to emphasize the need to update the unification discourse to reflect the changing times as seen in global politics and inter-Korean relations. He is also likely to highlight the value of liberal democracy, taking into account the human rights violations by the North Korean regime. Yun has previously said unification is needed to expand the universal values of freedom and human rights enshrined in South Korean democracy. South Korea's constitution does not recognize the North as a separate state and seeks peaceful unification based on a free and democratic order. Meanwhile, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un earlier this year called to revise the North's constitution, deeming Seoul its principal enemy and setting out to completely occupy and subjugate the South in the event of war. The Kim regime has ignored Seoul's call for dialogue and diplomacy towards a peaceful resolution of Pyongyang's threat to regional security. In his Liberation Day speech in 2022, Yoon introduced this audacious initiative, a roadmap for the denuclearization of North Korea, with corresponding measures to provide food, energy, infrastructure and healthcare for its people. A survey last year showed 43.8% of South Korean adults believe unification is necessary, down 10 percentage points from 2019. Resolving North Korea's nuclear threat was deemed the most important task for unification, followed by the easing of military tensions, then economic and cultural exchanges. Oh Young, Arirang News. 
North Korea sent more trash can balloons across the border over the weekend. But this time, only about 10 of over 200 balloons ended up in the south. The regime likely realized the wind was blowing in the wrong direction, but appears to have sent them anyway. Our Pins explains more. North Korea has once again flown trash-carrying balloons towards South Korea. South Korea's military said Sunday that the regime flew around 240 balloons, but only around 10 of the balloons, mostly carrying paper and plastic bottles, landed in the northern part of Gyeonggi-do province. It added that the balloons did not contain any dangerous material. An expert noted that this reflects the urgency with which Kim Jong-un insisted on another launch. I think this shows that this is a country where the orders are given at the very top by Kim Jong-un himself, and then the people on the ground, the military in this instance, uh, carry them out without questioning. I think they must have realized that the wind was blowing in the wrong direction, but they launched the balloons anyway. This is the 11th time that the North has sent trash balloons since late May. In recent weeks, the regime has flown around 3,800 balloons in what it said was retaliation for the flying of anti-Pyongyang propaganda across the border by South Korean civilian activists. In response, the South has been activating loudspeakers near the border since late last month, blasting broadcasts of propaganda messages and K-pop songs. So apart from the summit with Putin, this year hasn't gone well for Kim Jong-un. So when they add the, the South Korean uh, defector groups uh, balloon launches, I think the regime is becoming really desperate to shut down this, this heterodox propaganda that's coming into the country. This also comes after Kim Jong-un delivered harsh comments toward the South, calling the country trash. While visiting a flooded area and meeting victims of those affected by the recent devastating flood, the North Korean leader claimed that the Korean media reports on the North flood damage were fabricated. Seoul's unification ministry assessed Monday that by criticizing the South, North Korea intends to minimize public dissent by redirecting blame to external forces. Peun's Arirang News. South Korea and the United States are set to kick off their annual Ulji Freedom Shield exercise next Monday. The exercise is designed to strengthen the Allies' combined defense posture against North Korea's increasing missile threats, GPS jamming, and cyber attacks. In particular, Seoul and Washington will aim to further strengthen their capability to deter and defend against the regime's weapons of mass destruction. The UFS is a major combined military and civil exercise that includes a computer-based simulation, combined field training exercises, and Uchi civil defense drills involving government agencies. The exercise will run for 11 days until August 29th. Moscow says Ukrainian troops have advanced some 30 kilometers inside Russia, and Russia is continuing airstrikes against major Ukrainian cities, including Kyiv, with Moscow found to be using North Korean missiles. Lee Seung-jae reports. During the two and a half years of the war in Ukraine, Russia has been on the offensive for the most part, with Ukraine doing all it can to defend itself. But the tide has seemingly turned, with Ukraine now sending troops into Russia. The Ukrainian offensive in Russia's Kursk region is now on the sixth day, with Moscow calling it a federal emergency and admitting that Ukrainian troops have advanced far into its territory. According to Moscow's defense ministry on Sunday, Ukrainian troops have advanced some 30 kilometers inside Russia in what is being considered the most significant infiltration within the Russian territory since the war began in February 2022. The comments come a day after Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky confirmed that his troops are fighting in Russia. Today, I received several reports from Commander-in-Chief Sirsky regarding the front lines and our actions to push the war onto the aggressor's territory. I am grateful to every Defense Forces unit for ensuring that. Ukraine is proving that it can indeed restore justice and ensure the necessary pressure on the aggressor. The statements mark the first time that the Ukrainian president had officially admitted to the incursion, having remained quiet despite being days into its operation. In response to the Ukrainian offensive, Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova accused Ukraine of intimidating the peaceful population of Russia. 
Meanwhile, Russia has continued its airstrikes in major Ukrainian cities overnight, including the capital Kyiv, killing two people, including a four-year-old child and his father. Kyiv's Air Force says it shot down 53 of the 57 Russian attack drones, adding that Russia had used North Korea's KN-23 short-range ballistic missiles during the offensive. With Ukraine sending its troops inside Russia and Moscow looking to both counter and respond to their offensives, the prolonged war could see more bloodshed moving forward. Lee Jae, Arirang News. Data shows that in the first half of 2024, the number of people visiting South Korea for educational purposes reached an all-time high, surpassing 200,000. Now, the influence of a global Korean wave appears to be the driver. Yoon Jin reports. According to data released by the Korea Tourism Organization on Monday, the number of foreigners that came to South Korea to study for training or other learning surpassed 200,000 in the first half of this year. That is a 50.6 percent increase from the same period the previous year and also a new record. The KTO suggests the reason for the increase is the continued influence of the global K-wave that has resulted in more foreigners wanting to learn the Korean language or study in Korea. By nationality, around 55.2 percent, or 112,000 of the 204,000 visitors, were from China, followed by 33,000 from Vietnam, 6,900 from Japan, 6,700 from Mongolia, and 5,000 from Uzbekistan. And more than 3,000 visitors came from both France and the United States. The KTO says global interest in South Korea has increased due to the influence of K-content, like K-pop, K-movies, K-dramas, K-beauty, and K-food. The number of foreigners visiting Korea for educational purposes had steadily increased before the COVID-19 pandemic in the second half of 2019 to 191,000 people, but dropped significantly to 30,000 in the second half of 2020. Meanwhile, the South Korean government and universities outside the capital area have agreed to more MOUs and partnerships to increase the number of international students. Universities have been creating new programs catered to foreign students wanting to learn the Korean language and culture, as the government implements policies to ease visa restrictions for international students. A researcher from the Korea Small Business Institute, a research institution for the sustainable development of small and medium-sized enterprises, said that rather than bringing experts from abroad, it is more realistic to add international students who can speak Korean into the labor force adding that the government should consider expanding programs and support measures. Ian Jin, Arirang News. As the heat wave in South Korea continues, many people are suffering from sleepless nights. As on Monday, the capital Seoul saw 22 consecutive days of tropical nights. This is the third most tropical nights in a row since 1907. A tropical night is when temperatures stay at a minimum of 25 degrees Celsius between 6 p.m. and 9 a.m. Temperatures on Monday are also expected to feel as high as 35 degrees Celsius in most parts of the country. The Korea Meteorological the Meteorological Administration says the sweltering heat is to continue throughout the rest of the week, leading into next week as well. And some areas will be seeing rain showers as the atmosphere becomes unstable. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. With the U.S. Democratic National Convention set to take place in Chicago next week, President Joe Biden, former Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton have been confirmed as speakers at the convention. The Democratic Convention, which runs from August 19th to 22nd, will see Vice President Kamala Harris formally accept the Democratic Party's nomination to run for the presidency. Harris who is the first black woman and first Indian American to secure a major party's presidential nomination in the U.S., raised a historic 310 million U.S. dollars for her campaign last month. Over the weekend, Biden also gave his first interview since withdrawing from the White House race, telling CBS Sunday morning that he quit his re-election bid to defeat Trump. Biden said he feared that an intra-party battle regarding his candidacy would be a real distraction for Democrats and that he would do whatever Vice President Harris thinks needs to be done to beat Trump. 
Moving over to Uganda, the collapse of a landfill site in the country's capital, Kampala, has killed at least 21 people as of Sunday, with local police saying that casualties may rise further. After weeks of torrential rain, a hill of garbage at the city's only landfill site collapsed late on Friday, burying and crushing homes on the edges of the site as residents slept. Kampala City Police confirmed that at least 21 deaths have been reported so far, while at least 14 have been rescued. The Kampala City Authority added that while details of the accident were yet unclear, there was a structural failure in waste mass that triggered the landslide. President Yoweri Museveni ordered an investigation into the incident while stating that he had directed the removal of all residents living near the Kitizi landfill site. Now Kampala authorities have reportedly been considering closing the landfill site and moving into a larger area outside the city, but the plan has so far failed to take place. Following Friday's plane crash in Brazil that killed 62 people on board, the chief of the Brazilian Aviation Accident Investigation Center said Sunday that 100% of the data from the aircraft's black boxes had been fully extracted and are being analyzed. Speaking at a press conference, Marcelo Moreno said that the black boxes, which include voice recordings and flight data, are being analyzed by Canadian and French experts, technicians from the manufacturer of the aircraft, ATR, and the engine manufacturer, Pratt & Whitney, alongside the authority. The ATR-72 turboprop bound for Sao Paulo from Cascaval crashed at around 1.30 p.m. local time on Friday, some 80 kilometers northwest of Sao Paulo. According to the Brazilian Air Force, the aircraft was flying normally until 1.21 p.m. before losing radar contact at 1.22 p.m. and no emergency was reported by pilots. Moreno said a preliminary report would be released within 30 days. Australian Olympic breaking athlete Rachel Gunn, known as B-Girl Ray Gunn, broke social media with a performance at the Olympic event on Friday. 36-year-old Gunn, a lecturer at Macquarie University in Sydney, researching cultural politics of breaking, left fans puzzled by her dancing, which included laying on the stage with incomplete moves and flailing around with her hand on her chin and jumping around, appearing to mimic a kangaroo. Gunn lost all three of her round-robin battles without scoring a single point at the Games. While Gunn received ridicule on social media, Olympic breaking chief judge Martin M.G. Billity Gillian said B-girl Ray Gunn had done nothing wrong even though she failed to score a point, adding that she was trying to be original and bring something new to the table. Kim Xiang, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Not much of an update in terms of weather as a searing stretch of heat continues today and through this week with temperatures showing no signs of backing off. And there will be a chance of rain during the day. 5 to 40 millimeters of passing showers are in the forecast along with thunderstorms during the day today. And UV rays will beam down until that rain passes by. Afternoon temperatures look like being similar to slightly higher than yesterday. Seoul and Daejeon getting up to 35 degrees Celsius. Daegu, Gyeongju should see a high of 34 degrees this afternoon. The first half of the week looks like being hotter with rain in the forecast on Jeju from Wednesday into Friday. However, that rain will not bring much relief from the heat to the island. Meanwhile, Thursday marks National Liberation Day here in Korea. Heat usually dies down a bit around the holiday, but it does not seem like this will be the case this year. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions.
That's all we have at this hour. Arirang News will be back at 2 p.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.